you have had settlement here in the city of Bloom for certainly for 6,000 years. So if you know where to look, or if you have somebody to guide you, and of course in, in ecotourism this is one of the most important dimensions, that you need the local community to interpret and to open the thing up to you, uh, it means that you can find echoes of human settlement of earlier communities from every phase of the human past in Slave Bloom. So what problems do we have to tackle here to encourage ecotourism? Well, one of the first challenges is for people uh, to realise just what they have. And the first step that's necessary there is to look around and carry out, very professionally now, a resource inventory of the total environmental heritage. And then to stand back with the help of informed eyes of people who are professionals in this area uh, and ask the question, well, what is special about our place? One person who knows what's special about the area is Christina Byrne. She's a relative newcomer and recognised the potential immediately. Christine, why are you getting involved in ecotourism in this area? Well, I moved to this area about 10 years ago and when you move into an area from outside, you uh, appreciate it much more. And I realised that there was a very special environment here in the Schlieve Blooms. So I got involved in the local uh, development society and um, we started by promoting walking. And uh, we have a, a walking festival which is going for 12 years. And we have guided walks every Sunday in the Steve Blooms from May to October, which are led by local people. And, uh, you know, all of those people believe in what they have and they want other people outside of the area to get to know the environment that is here in the Steve Blooms. In 10 years, Christina's group has done a lot to protect and promote Schlieve Bloom's natural beauty. But she's recently stepped up a gear by joining European partners to bring on board new levels of management expertise. Can you tell us about your European partners? We're partnered with Midi Pyrenees, which is a rural area in the south of France, and a similar area in Tuscany, and a few areas in Poland and Finland. We have meetings two or three times each year where we have discussions as to what we're doing. So we're setting up a model here that can be used by anywhere else, whether it be in Ireland or whether it be in Europe. Christina is focused on getting local people to participate in the project. Once they do this, it seems they no longer take their area for granted. Already there are other people in the area who have ideas for uh, buildings, they have ideas to create a wilderness garden, they have ideas to create a um, transport system that won't harm the environment. They're all ideas that have started in the last 12 months. When you talk about an eco-tourist, what sort of a person is this? I'm talking about the ordinary person that has uh, an appreciation of the, the local environment, the local landscape, the local food, and who enjoy a natural experience. That's the kind of person I'm talking about. I'm not talking about somebody who uh, wants to live in a hut in the middle of the, <laughs> the woods or whatever. This type of tourist is notoriously hard to please. Yeah. 15 years ago, 10 years ago, it wasn't perhaps taken really seriously. Nowadays, that end of the tourism spectrum, and you've got the mass tourism end at one end, uh, and you've got the alternative tourism at the other end, if you like, of which ecotourism is, is, is one branch. Uh, it's almost as big in many respects as mainstream tourism, but you're not as aware of it. What sort of opportunities would ecotourism bring to this area? The ecotourists may be, uh, I suppose they're a bit more difficult to cater for than the normal tourist because they expect a certain standard. whether it be in recycling or the way you uh, build your house or the type of transport. But all of those things will help us in our environment to give us a better environment to live in, as well as making the area, uh, creating a more sustainable product. Christina's project has been watched carefully by our European partners. If it works, it will provide a template that will work everywhere. Protecting an area of natural beauty by the seemingly contradictory idea of bringing people to it relies on a very delicate balancing act. How do you guarantee them that they will actually get that sort of quality of management of, of environment? 
Well, they won't come back for a start unless they do get it the first time. So a project is not going to survive unless it's characterised from the start by that sort of, of serious environmental responsibility. It's not something that you can pretend. Uh, this has to be something that the host community themselves are sufficiently environmentally aware to be able to understand the significance and importance of uh, and to do genuinely. I think tourism took off very fast in Ireland um, a number of years ago without people actually planning it. Planning it. We have a chance to plan it now in a, in a way that we want to, to go. It's going to take time to do this but it will be both benefit us economically and the environment that we live in. What do you think of the fact that the majority of our waste goes to landfill? I think it's very regrettable. I think that the less it goes to landfill, the better, because uh, the stuff that goes to landfill, God knows how long it's going to be there, years, and it's just going to slowly decompose and rot. If it's recycled, it can be reused and uh, it doesn't occupy valuable land, you know? It doesn't cause pollution. And I look forward to the day when we're going to get another bin where we can put our domestic waste and other things into it, you know? I think, it's a, I think it makes a tremendous difference. I would do my best to keep as much out of landfill as I can. Mm. Um, I think that places like this are great and places like are the websites like, like Leinster Free Cycle and stuff like that where people are giving stuff for free and just saying I don't want to dump this is it use, of use to anybody else. Mm, I think that's, they're great mm. things. And do you think the separating of the waste makes a big difference? Well you know you hear these urban myths that it's, it's all going to landfill anyway. Mm. Um, I hope not because it definitely takes more effort mm. to recycle to separate my, my waste it's more effort and I would like to think that it's being brought wherever, Germany or whatever, mm. something being done with it, mm. rather than it going into landfill, because we're only making problems for the future, mm. for, our, for ourselves and for our children. Last few years we've been producing an awful lot of waste. Uh, we've had a period of immense um, economic development and as a result we're, we seem to be throwing away a lot, a lot of things probably that we wouldn't have thrown away in the past. Our grandparents before us would probably never have dreamt of throwing away some of the things that we throw away. Sometimes you know we replace new items uh, with even newer ones, latest models, things like that. So we're facing a big challenge. We have a lot of uh, waste to, to manage and we need the infrastructure to manage that and that is, is our, one of our biggest challenges at the moment. I went to meet Caroline Clancy from Dublin City Council to see an experimental pilot scheme to introduce brown bins into the Dublin area. Caroline, food has been a big problem for years in our bins, hasn't it? It has, Duncan. If you look at a typical household bin, over a third of the material in that bin is food and garden waste, which really is a resource that should not be going to landfill and it should be used for compost. Because when it's in a landfill, it breaks down and it gives off greenhouse gases that are harmful to our environment. to wrap their food, especially their cooked food, in newspaper. Um, the reason we do that is so as it will soak up any sort of spillages or liquids or fats that will be on the food. We would ask people to not use plastic bags because that will interfere with the composting process and you won't get a good quality compost if you use plastic or biodegradable bags. We would also ask people to only use the brown bin for organic material and not for anything else. So how often will the brown bin be collected? The brown bin is collected every second week and on alternate weeks to that the black bin is collected. 
Is that saving the householder money? It will save the householder money because there is a financial incentive for the householder because it's cheaper to leave out the brown bin than it is to leave out your black bin. I dropped in on Nuala McElhenney, who's one of the first people in the area to receive a brown bin, to see how it fits into the weekly cycle. I actually didn't realise how much waste is actually recyclable and can actually go in there. Everything. Absolutely, everything goes into it and it's just brilliant. So what I do is we fill the, the caddy and we just go out then into the garden and we tip it into the actual brown bin. For our skins and vegetables and stuff, we're inclined to put them in loose. If there's any meats or anything that need the fatty content absorbed, we wrap them in newspaper and put it out then. And it does make a difference, particularly if this is day one of a fortnightly cycle, right? And is it saving you money? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because this goes out every fortnight now, yeah, is it? Yeah, it does. So with the amount of waste that you're actually saving from landfill through your brown bin now, has it made you more aware of waste generally? Absolutely. I find when I go shopping too, I find when I'm buying vegetables, when I'm buying fruits or anything like that, that I buy things with less packaging on them. Because if I buy fresh produce, I know that I'm actually putting nothing back out, you know, um, into my normal black bin. Most uh, local authorities now do have a green bin which that they can put their recyclables into. In areas where they don't have a, a green bin, they use their bring banks and their civic community sites. But um, a third bin, a brown bin as it's called, will probably become the norm in the future, yeah. The future is that we have to divert waste from landfill. It's, it's more sustainable in the long run that we would make compost. We have this resource nearly, which is organic, that will break down into compost. Why not use it? The material collected from the brown bin is composted and put back into Dublin's parks and amenity areas, thus closing the cycle. Historically, our woodlands were once our crowning glory, covering our countryside in a mosaic of forests. Our land was colonised by oak, ash, elm, scotspine, yew and many others. However, by 1901, only 1% of our forests were still standing. Replanting came in the form of the Sitka spruce, a species foreign to these shores, planted as part of a commercial scheme for social and economic reasons. Obviously, the removal of our native species and subsequent replacement with monoculture had some impacts on the environment. I met up with some of the scientists who had just completed their first ever field study in this area. How did we end up with so much monoculture forest? I suppose you have to look at the history of the development of forest industry in Ireland and much of the trees that are planted are, are now being harvested in fact um, were, to build, or were planted for social reasons, for local employment, for feeding local sawmills and local activity. So if you like we have inherited a certain kind of forest estate which is largely monoculture and we're now working towards a much more diverse forest estate which either by second rotation or when we're planting new forests we're putting in mixes of species. By retaining the existing habitat, you're retaining the existing complement of species that would have been there. The oak woodlands, which would have been, I suppose, classically part of Ireland, one of the major characteristics of those was that they had lots of areas for, for animals to, to burrow through and to actually become what we call ecological engineers, where they burrow holes to put their nests and so forth. Now, obviously, in a, in a, a plantation like a Sitka spruce, that's not that easy. Remember, animals and plants actually rely on certain species associations. So if you have a, a Sitka spruce, there will be certain plants and animals associated with those. The more you diversify those, the greater number of species that you can have in the forest. And I presume if there's a wide variety of species, you're going to get more and more birds, more more mammals, etc., in the forest also. Absolutely, up to a certain level. And if you take the island of Ireland, for example, there's a maximum pool of species that can actually come into a habitat. So you're quite right. And you know what some people argue then, well, if we take something out, if something goes extinct, does it really matter? And there are arguments about that that may be fine if you don't get a disturbance, if you don't get climate change, for example, if you don't get these big 
global disturbances. If you take a species out, then you might find that there's no capacity for the ecosystem to recover. So people talk about what's called functional redundancy. That sounds very grandiose, but it's essentially each species having its own role in a habitat or an ecosystem. And if you take it out, then you damage it. You damage the function, you lose the species, and you might change the structure. Just outside McCroom, I found the remote forest where Mark Wilson had spent years researching biodiversity, monitoring the effects of sunlight on plants and animals. He gave me a tour of his field study site, starting with the dark interior of the monoculture forest. I don't want to give the impression that this kind of forest would always have such little biodiversity in it, in the, in the centre of it. When forest is very young, when it's just been planted, uh, obviously the canopy hasn't closed, so there's lots of light still getting into the forest floor. And when forest is older than this, then if it's a plantation like this, then foresters will tend to thin it, which will reopen the canopy. If it's a natural forest, the same process would happen, or a similar one, in that trees would grow old, they would die, and treefold gaps would let light back into the forest floor. So then you would start having more vegetation and more complexity. So what you see here is probably the forest that is worst for biodiversity. We then moved to an area that had been thinned to see what differences light made. Now you can clearly see that this area is different from the one that we were in. You've got much bigger trees, they're widely spaced because this area has been felled. And as a result, there's lots of light coming through. You've got much more ground vegetation. You've even got a holly tree over there, which is an example that there's shrub layer coming back into here. And if you look over towards the river on the right, the gap there has allowed lots of shrubs and ground vegetation to come in there as well. What about mixed species? We concentrated on just a few species. We looked at Sitka spruce, and we also looked at ash to take an example of a broadleaf. And we found that even just looking at those two species, that if you mix them up, it can result in benefits for biodiversity. So including more tree species is almost certainly going to be good too. Apart from being divided into dark and light areas, the forest can also be studied at different layers. You can think about it in terms of vegetation vertical structure. The structure here is very simple. You have nothing on the floor, you have tree trunks, and then you have a canopy. Whereas where you have a bit more light, then you have everything going on here in the road gap. You All have, naturally regenerated. You have a, a dense vegetation there, you have lots of shrubs, you have small trees. So as well as the tall canopy, you have all the other layers in between, which are all used by different types of biodiversity. It seemed an off-the-wall idea, looking for diversity in plantation forests. One's preliminary impression to most biologists is that plantation forests are dreary, dark and lifeless places. And we were asked to find out what sort of biological diversity is there within the forest estate. A forest is much more than just the trees and within the forest estate you've got uh, clearings, open areas which are of crucial importance and then you've got all the different stages of the forest cycle. A loss of biodiversity is something that is happening and the effects of that loss are still very hard to determine. I liken this to the aircraft that's lo losing the occasional nut or bolt out of the wing or out of the undercarriage. Most of those nuts and bolts I suppose we can do without, but who's to say what's the critical nut or bolt that's just about to fall out of this aircraft earth? It's very hard to know what we can do without. Species have always gone extinct, but the rate of extinction has gone up globally in a most dramatic way in recent decades. The basis of this project came out of the State of the Environment report back in the year 2000, um, which covered how we did not really have a great grasp of knowledge on biodiversity in our Irish forests. And at the time we were just starting to ramp up afforestation in the country where we're looking at planting 20,000 hectares per year of extra forest to bring ourselves up to the 17% of land cover. So there's a huge change in land use and land use type 
occurring in Ireland and this will have a knock-on effect on biodiversity and we just felt that it was important for us to get a handle on what this change was going to mean to Ireland and Ireland's environment. The change, I guess, is dependent on how we manage things. Up to date, I suppose, a lot of forest planting has been monocultural and we've been clear felling large areas at the same age of trees, so we've been sort of losing out a bit in the forest where we've seen the range of ages of trees and the range of species which would be more natural to an Irish forest. And as a result of this project and some of the, the earlier initiatives undertaken, we should be able to start improving things. So the research you've done now, can that be applied in the wider scale now into our typical forests in Ireland? I think it can, and we've had this interesting... Uh, I, mean, this, I, mean, I think it's important to say that this research hasn't occurred in some sort of ivory tower. We're working towards a much broader strategy for forests. So timber production, yes. Biodiversity, yes. Depending on the site, depending on the species of tree. So what are the hopes for the future? I guess the hopes for the future is that we can put trees in the right places and plan them in a way that's sustainable, plan the, the shapes and the species mix so it can optimise biodiversity objectives. Now for the first time we can use hard facts, information to say this is what's happening and this is what's likely to happen under different scenarios. If you plant these mixes, these are the likely species of animals that you're going to get there. If you don't plant these mixes, you will run into trouble. In our next programme, we bring you a plan to protect our woodlands into the future. We look at the legacy of 30 years of dumping. And we ask, who looks after the rivers flowing across our borders? See you then. <laughs>